So we're just gonna dive right in. And thank you so much for the invitation. Um, huge shout out to Leaf and Lim for everything you're doing to support this. This is a great opportunity. Um, and I do wanna share a little bit about Cooperative Extension just as we're getting started because we're in every county. If you live in North Carolina, we're here for you. And we're actually all across the nation too. So this is a really great resource. It's a nationwide network of researchers, educators, volunteers. Uh, a long time ago, we figured out it was not enough to research how to grow a better blueberry. You then had to go to explain to people how to grow that better blueberry. That's our job. That's what we do. We do science communication. We do research. We will answer every sort of weird question you have from what's killing my plant to what is this bug? I get a lot of questions that are just random shots of bugs, right? <laughs> I help you figure that out. So a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna cover today just to get you oriented, and we're gonna try and do a little bit of it all. I am a nerd by nature. I like knowing what's actually going on, right? I like kind of the deeper answers, and so I'm trying to give you some of that so that you're oriented to what you're actually thinking about when you're thinking about soil. So we're gonna talk about some of the properties of soil from the physical to the chemical to the biological. We're gonna talk about plant nutrients. Basically, how do you build a plant? Why does soil matter so much? And how you can learn more about your soil through soil testing. And finally, we're gonna put it all together to help you figure out how to grow what you want. So first and foremost, we think we're growing plants. We are growing soil, okay? Everything that you see here, anything you might wanna plant from a beautiful pollinator garden to, we'll talk about this, um, but I technically support you because I'm required to by my job um, if you wanna grow that lawn. Any of these things though, you're gonna be growing soil first, right? That is your first and foremost. And that's because what we see, what we think of, is all this stuff above the ground. But I've heard that described one time as that's like the public life of plants. But the roots are their private life. It's where they do all the work. It's where they support themselves, where they grow. Everything that it takes to build a plant is taken from basically the air or the soil. And a lot of it is taken from the soil. And so when we think about growing, we're actually thinking about soil. How do we make healthier soil? So many of us optimistically plant plants where there's not enough sunlight. I know I'm guilty of that and they fail. We also plant plants where the soil was never going to support that plant, right? Like it didn't have what it needed to build its body and then we're shocked when it doesn't build its body and it dies, right? So there, that is why we care about soil. For a soil scientist, they are all about three major things. About the physical, chemical, and biological aspects of soil. So what is soil, right? Chemically, how does it interact with plants and with other things? And biologically, and this is what we're becoming so appreciative of now. Biologically, what do we need to keep that soil healthy? You know, humans for a long time, we look at something and we're like, I'm sure I can do that better. <laughs> soil has actually figured itself out pretty well, and it's the biology of soil that keeps it really moving. Um, so, so much of what we think about soil, so this is kind of a zoomed in picture of soil. Soil is really comprised of, and this is a great Bryceism, space and stuff, okay? Yeah, it's funny, so you know what it says. Um, it's space and stuff, and when we think about that, what do I mean? It's that you have some of these, I'm gonna give up on that. We have some of these larger particles, we have smaller particles, we have all these things, and what we're really actually hoping is that they are all grouped in a way that there's space between them too. That's where air goes, that's where water goes, that's where all of the kind of important other things go, right? Roots are just like us, they need to breathe. They will drown if they're in too much water or, and they will dry out if they can't get access to water. So and in a really ideal soil, and this is kind of hilarious because obviously a tropical plant does not need the same as what a cactus does, right? This is kind of what we think of as just like a baseline ideal. You have about 50% space and 50% stuff. In that space, you want about half of it full of air and half of it full of water. That means there's enough air to breathe and there's enough water to get nutrients, to take up water for growth. In the 50% stuff, you're gonna have about 45% of that mineral. So that's actually something that's like sand, silt, clay, and you have about 5% organic matter. 5% doesn't sound like a lot, but in our hot, humid climate, it's a lot. And if that developer just scraped off all your topsoil, Ooh, it's really a lot, right? <laughs> like you're gonna, you're gonna have to rebuild that. When we think about the 45% that's mineral, this is what we think of oftentimes as soil, right? The actual particles of soil. And so we have three major particles, sand, silt, and clay. Sand you can think of as being as big as almost like a beach ball, right? It's huge. Silt might then be almost like a golf ball. 
And clay would be like a grain of rice, but even smaller. Huge size differences, right? And not only that, but the clay is shaped differently. It's flat, it stacks. Another way you can think about it is almost like cards in a deck where they'll just stack up really tight on each other. So if you imagine pouring water through a bunch of beach balls versus pouring water through a bucket of rice, those beach balls, like that water is gone, right? Spill a drink on the beach, it's gone. On clay, you're not gonna see that water come out of that rice again. Like anyone who's ever tried to wash rice, you keep getting water in the rice, right? For the nerdier like myself, what does that actually mean? This is just a picture of sand, right? You know sand, like we, we know sand, that makes sense. Whereas on the other side, you actually have pictures under a microscope of clay particles. They're really differently shaped, they're significantly smaller, and they're what we're mostly dealing with, okay? Anyone who has not seen our clays, just go dig. Right, like you will find it. <laughs> Go to any construction site, you will see it. Some of you randomly are gonna have sand um, because of kind of like the geologic history of that area. Just talk to me afterwards if that's you. I'd love to talk you through that, but this is where we're gonna spend most of our time is we're gonna spend most of our time talking about clay and how do you deal with clay. Why does it matter? This is a great picture. <laughs> Fun fact, if you ever want to learn about soils, um, the Wikipedia entry for uh, Ultasol, which is our soil type, was clearly written by someone from NC State because it entirely just references our region, which is really interesting. Um, clay really matters because of water holding capacity. Our clays do this funny thing where they will both hold way too much water, but they will also dry out way too hard, right? So if there's water in them, they hold that water, they can drown your plants. The moment they start drying out too much, they don't want water at all and it will be hard to get them wet again, right? And so we're balancing this thing of too much water versus drying out into basically a brick at any given time. Aeration, they get compacted really easily, right? It's a lot easier to stack a bunch of cards than to stack beach balls. So when they do that, you don't have any space between the stuff and all of a sudden water and air can't get in at all. One huge perk of our clays, and we'll talk about why in a minute, they are phenomenal for holding nutrients. We have a couple of nutrients that we don't have quite as much of, but in general, they are like little nutrient bombs. Clay is phenomenal for nutrients. Like it is actually a reason why I would rather start with clay than with sand any day of the week. Soil strength. I understand anyone who has uh, foundation cracks is not gonna believe me, but something like clay is easier to build on than something like uh, sand, right? Try to build on sand and it's just gonna kind of fall apart. If you try to do that here on clay, we have a lot more soil strength that's actually a lot easier to kind of work with. Our soils are super variable across the state. It's one of the reasons why when we talk about native plants, I don't care what grows in the mountains. I'm far more interested in what would grow even north and south of where we are, right? These are kind of these dark, loamy soils that you get in the mountains, you get sands out at the coast, and then you actually even get some very dark soils even further out. Here we have clay. This is why no matter how much you loved that plant when you were visiting your friend in Asheville, it's probably not for you. Um, like it, it might be, but like read about it first. Our clays are kind of the major dictate of what we're doing. This clay band that we're in, the Piedmont, it actually goes all the way up over even into parts of Delaware, it goes further south. I would be inter interested in Piedmont plants more than I'd be interested in North Carolina plants. So why are our soils little awesome nutrient bombs? So first, it's all about soil chemistry. It's all about that clay. Okay, so imagine you have a particle, whether it's sand, whether it's clay, whatever, it's, whatever it is, it actually has all these little negative charges on it. Okay, this is gonna be chemistry, it's fine, we're gonna get through it, some of you are gonna love it, some of you are gonna be like, oh, flashback to high school, it's fine. <laughs> if you, <laughs> I'm in the latter group, I feel you. Um, so if you take this particle and it's got all these little negative charges on it, and you split it in half, you have more negative charges, you have increased surface area, right? So the more surface area you have, if those charges are all on the outside, the more negative charges you have. So if you imagine, again, that beach ball split apart into a million grains of rice, you have way more surface area there. You have way more negative charges. And why this matters is because so many of the nutrients that our plants want and love and need, they actually exist in the soil as positively charged particles that stick to that. So our clay can really hold on to them. Sand doesn't hold on to them half as well as ours does. And what happens then is that those little, part, those little nutrients, they go, they hang out on our clay, water pulls them off sometimes, our plants, they grow their roots down into that soil, 
They can pick up those nutrients from the clay. It's wonderful, it's perfect. It means that oftentimes we don't have to worry about fertilizing that much. Um, sometimes you have to add phosphorus, but other than that, like we're pretty much good typically for most things, especially ornamentals that you wanna grow. So our clay is awesome. And so you might think, okay, if our clay is so great, why is my garden what, is what it is? Like, <laughs> you're telling me it's wonderful. I've seen it. It's not wonderful. <laughs> like, this is what we used to have, right? This is a picture of the Eno River. We had forests. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. But maybe you've heard about how the rainforest only exists because it exists, which sounds crazy, but that if you were to take the trees out of the rainforest, the soil there is actually very poor. And it's only the trees dropping leaves and dropping everything else like that that makes it have good enough soil for the trees. The same thing happened to us. When all of the forest was removed and when everything else was removed, a lot of the organic matter left. Our warm, humid climate eats it up, the organic matter goes away, and then we have this, right? The topsoil is scraped so that they can build. They're not evil, they just want your house to stay where they put it, you know, and then they don't put the topsoil back, but there's a, there's a reason that folks do this. But when this happens, this juicy bit right up here at the top, topsoil, the organic matter, it's gone. This is that subsoil Bruce was talking, or Bryce was talking about. And what happens is that all of the interesting biology, all of the interesting root growth, all of the interesting living action happens up here. So our job as gardeners is to replace that, to add that organic matter back. Because the cool thing about organic matter too is that organic matter in some forms is even smaller than clay. So it holds even more nutrients and it gets between those clay particles and it spaces them out. And so that little deck of cards has all these spacers in between it now. So you can have more air, you can have more water, right? You need organic matter. What are we left with after all that construction and after all those forests are taken out? Remember, we want 50% space, 50% stuff. We are left with on average 16% space, a lot of mineral content and very little organic content. Right, we lost all of our space. There's no room for the roots, there's no room for breathing, there's no room for water, there's no room for any of that. We have highly compacted soils with little topsoil. And that's what we're all about. We're all about that topsoil and about that organic matter. The reason the organic matter matters so much is because you know we talk about sand, silt, and clay, but it's not just like you dump a bunch of sand, silt, clay into a bucket and you have a soil. Where the magic really happens is actually how those particles organize themselves into what we call aggregates, right? And so how this works is really that we are looking to have uh, living biology in that soil. We're looking to have critters, roots, microbes, all of these things doing wonderful things, making everything organized in a way that we humans really can't. We are asking ecology and biology to do that work for us. The more organic matter we add, the better the structure, so the better organized all the particles are. We get less compaction, the clay gets spaced out. We have better water infiltration, so the water can go in more easily. So right, when you have a big rain, you don't just watch it wash off into the storm drain thinking it would have been nice if that had hit my plants. <laughs> that water can actually go in and it can move through the soil better. And you also have improved nutrient availability because as great as the clays are, the organic matter is even better for nutrients and it helps the water move better. How do we do this? Plant roots improve soil health. Luckily, you as gardeners, you are interested in getting plant roots into soil, so you're already doing one of the major things. Plant roots actually really do interesting things. When they're alive, they add sugars and other things to the soil that actually feed the microbes that build the soil. When they die, they decompose, opening up channels, right? So then you have more space. As the soil gets better, more organisms come, and the soil gets better right? You do not have to go out and buy a bag of whatever and add it to your soil, right? Some like fungal mix or anything else like that. If you make a nice space, all of these critters want to be there, right? It's like Bryce talking about ladybugs. Don't dump a bag of ladybugs on the lawn. If you have a good space for ladybugs, the ladybugs will come, right? If you have good soil with good, good organic matter, those microbes will come and make your soil even better. Soil has a really complex food web and that's always what we're trying to promote. A better garden is a more diverse garden. A better soil is more ecologically diverse and it will support itself. And anything you're worried about bringing in as a bad guy, if that bad guy is, long there, is there long enough, typically his predator shows up too. 
right? If there's a buffet, like someone's coming, <laughs> right? <laughs> so what do you do to get the most out of your soil? This is a picture from here. I just love it. It's beautiful. It's lush, living roots everywhere, right? That's how I see this when I'm thinking about soils. I don't think about the plants. I'm like, think of all the roots, right? <laughs> like, that's wonderful. <laughs> so think about what a plant is, right? A plant is this wonderful, magical thing that takes sunlight and uses it to convert CO2 into basically its body, right? So everything that a plant is doing, it's doing either powered by sunlight and using air or in what it's taking up from its roots. Some of the primary nutrients that we use for plants or that plants use to build themselves, they get carbon, oxygen, hydrogen from the air, but they get nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium um, and a number of other really essential plant nutrients from the soil. They have to get these from the soil. Luckily, our clays are pretty good. Phosphorus can be like a little bit of like an asterisk, but we'll talk about that or come talk to me about that afterwards. How do you know if you have enough nutrients in your soil? Anybody who's like, I can just tell. <laughs> they can't. <laughs> Sounds nice. You do a soil test. Uh, we have soil sampling supplies here um, over on the desk. I can talk to anybody. I will stick around. I will talk to you as long as you want about soil sampling within reason. Um, and we have soil sample boxes, supplies. This is a free test that the North Carolina Department of Agriculture does April through Thanksgiving the rest of the year. It is the exorbitant fee of $4 a sample, right? <laughs> like, this is a really great way to do it. If you want to learn more about this, I have a little article. You could just Google Durham soil testing, and it tells you about the whole process. What they're gonna tell you is really about the chemi chemistry of your soil. So they're not gonna tell you so much about the biology, about the organic matter. It's a little bit harder to get that from that test. The chemistry though, they'll tell you, do I have the right nutrients and do I have the right pH? Why do we care about pH? This is like my favorite graph ever. I don't know if you ever were shown a chart where they show you how compounding interest works and then all of a sudden you're like, oh God, I need to start saving money. <laughs> <laughs> like that's, that's how I feel about this chart. It's one of those kind of life-changing charts. So what this is, is there's pH along the bottom and a number of different plant nutrients or nutrients that affect plant growth. And if it's thin and red, at that pH, it's hard for the plant to get it. If it's nice and yellow or green, the plant can take it up. That's because pH actually affects plant nu nutrition. We start out down here with our clays somewhere 4.5, 5, really low. We want to adjust the pH up to somewhere in the 6, 6.5, even just under 7 range. That's where a lot of plants do really well. Because the interesting thing is that if my pH is too low, if it's down here, you start seeing all these red bars, right? I could add phosphorus until I was blue in the face. And if my pH isn't right, the plant can't see it, the camp, plant can't take it up. Doesn't matter. If I'm gonna adjust anything in my garden, I'm gonna adjust the pH before I add a bit of nutrient because this has got to be right. Once you do that, some of the major nutrients you might think about are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen is all about green leafy growth. Phosphorus is all about roots, flowers, fruits, seeds, not the leaves, I like to think of it as. Potassium is overall plant health. You'll always see them listed on fertilizer in that order. Their percentages, so if you were looking at a bag like that, that bag is 32% nitrogen, 10% phosphorus, 10% potassium. When you get your soil test back, it's really awesome because they will actually tell you exactly what you need to add for what you wanna grow. Don't worry about this, the details of this. I'm just telling you that they tell you. They will even give you a recommendation of the kind of fertilizer to buy, like the range to buy, how much to apply for a certain amount of space. There's math that can be done to convert that. Again, that is what your extension agent is for. We like live to help you interpret this, right? We are excited about that. <laughs> so putting it all together, what do we do? You probably have compacted soil with low organic matter. We know that. That's probably just your base point. Anyone who thinks that you don't have that, dig a little bit deeper. That's, that's my recommendation. What do you do? Break it up sometimes. We're increasingly moving away from tilling. Mm. The reason for that is because all of those critters that live in your soil, making your soil healthier, they like to be in your soil. They don't like to be in the air. They don't like to be exposed to everything, right? They're doing a good job just where they are. And so in some cases you break it up, but oftentimes that's only a very first step in a garden and I would know why I was doing that before I did it. Add organic matter. Keep adding organic matter. This is the thing you will do for the rest of your garden's life is adding organic matter. 
and keep your soil covered and full of living roots. For organic matter, when you're first setting up beds, it can be really, really useful to add three to six, eight, three to six inches of something like an aged pine bark fine, something that's a really fine mulch, right? You can mix it in as long as it's aged. It helps start building up that organic matter. Compost would work. After that, keeping your soil covered, two to three inches of mulch is enough to prevent a number of annual weeds. It's enough to um, keep water in, to keep the roots cool, to do all sorts of crazy benefits for your soil. When your mulch breaks down and you get annoyed because you have to reapply it every year, that's a good thing. That is the mulch breaking down into finer organic matter and working its way down into the soil, right? As annoying as that is, that is success. <laughs> Think about what you want to grow. Most plants around here will like increased drainage because of the compaction in the soil. So planting things a little bit higher or on raised berms uh, can be really successful. Native plants are adapted to our soils, but again, be reasonable. Think about our map. Those mountain plants are not the native plants for our clay, right? So keep that in mind. Fruits and vegetables will require extra work. I went out to a site visit one time and someone was like, I just want to grow my tomatoes in the ground because it's like natural. <laughs> I was like, they're from the Andes. <laughs> like, I don't, they don't want this. <laughs> okay. We have to really baby these guys because fruits and veggies are also plants that we're asking to perform so highly that we can take from them. Right? And azalea has to like flower once a year and then you're like, you're wonderful. <laughs> a tomato has to put like its entire weight into sugars that we steal as fruit, <laughs> right? For raised beds, and I just want to touch on this quickly because I know a lot of you will be interested in fruits and veggies, it's always worth going the raised bed route. You can get fancy, you can go basic, it can be cinder blocks, it can be wood. A raised bed doesn't even actually have to have walls. It can just be bermed up, right? You have options. You want it no more than four feet wide, it's not useful to not be able to reach into the middle of that bed. You should never walk on soil that you've prepared and that you're really excited about, right? You need to be able to reach should be at least eight inches deep. And if you're planting over something really solid like concrete or pavement, you might want it two or even three feet deep. And you can successfully do this. When you make those raised beds, I told you, strive like 5% organic matter is great. And most people hear that and they're like, organic matter is good. More organic matter is better. No, 5% <laughs> is really good. 20% is fine, I would be worried. Start with, because organic matter does funny, funny things. Start with something like a three to one mix of topsoil to organic matter because that organic matter will break down over time. So you're starting with enough. This is a beautiful garden. This is over um, at Plant Delights. They've done a wonderful job where they've bermed up the soil. They're staying off those beds. They're growing things. The plants are, I love how you're like, yeah, I would love to have that many luscious plants. Thank you for the advice. Um, but they keep their plants happy and healthy, and as they have more plants, it supports more plants, because again, those living roots feed their soil, right? We can get to this, actually. This is possible, but it's all about organic matter. Whenever I'm starting beds now, I actually always start by berming up like this. It also gives like the charming effect of you feel like you're walking into the garden, as opposed to it's just flat around you. Add more than you think you're going to need. It will break down over time. So I am, like, it's literally my job to help you guys. So if you ever have questions, do not feel free to reach out. Um, we have cooperative extension in every county. Find your local agent. We would love to help you. The Master Gardeners would love to help you. This is what we do. So thank you so much.